drink. This is the man room. Welcome into the man room. I'm your host, Marcus Bridges. Thanks for joining us tonight. Be sure to check us out at the website, www.themanroompodcast.com. And you can find us wherever you find your podcast: Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and be sure to subscribe to the RSS feed. Uh, you can also check us out on Facebook, or you can send me a Gmail, which I'll get personally, and I'll love it so much. The Man Room Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on Patreon. Uh, you can look us up there, and you can uh, donate for a few shekels. I'll actually be able to eat dinner tonight. Joining me today in the man room is a former colleague and dear friend of mine. Uh, he's been heard on radio waves throughout the USA for nearly two decades now, if my math is correct. Former host of the Donkey Show radio show, of which I was a part of here in Eugene, Oregon, and current host of Tanner and Drew on 105.9 The Brew in Portland, and Tanner and Drew's Donkey Show podcast heard daily on the iHeartRadio app. It's a pleasure for me to welcome into the man room uh, one of the guys that gave me my first opportunity in radio. Like I said, dear friend of mine, please welcome to the man room, Tanner. And I was just going to give you a nice little applause there, but I pressed the wrong button oh, and I'm was, already being a being a failure. I was going to applaud by myself. That's fine. <laughs> applauding myself. That's fine. Welcome, just dude. Smattering of applause. Welcome, hey, brother. How are you? I am so excited to be honest with you. Um, I. I talk to you every single day on a podcast that we do that we just mentioned, Tanner and Drew's Donkey Show podcast, and I am like wiggling nervous right now as if we've oh, never my. done this before. Um, well, I've, I think you're precious, and uh, <laughs> if I were there with you right now, I would touch your soft skin. Oh, I appreciate and you were, that. You read off a whole buttload of uh, of like uh, accounts. Like, geez, Louise, I think you're missing a farmer's only. <laughs> I think you're missing, um, I don't know, there's probably a couple others that, you, you know, I think Christian Mingle is one that you should be on probably. So, I don't know. <laughs> You're just missing some opportunities there. I, I appreciate that advice, and uh, I will definitely get on Christian Mingle for sure. I feel like the Man Room mm -hmm. podcast stands a real fine chance of finding a nice date on Christian Mingle. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's weird, man. I, I know that that's kind of that's something that happens with podcasts, and I hear it on a lot of the ones I listen to, but uh, it just kind of sucks that you don't have like a radio call number that you can just say, and that kind of covers everything. That's one yeah, thing yeah, yeah. I've learned about <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> Uh, but I am, I am learning and hopefully sooner or later, I'll say that enough that I won't have to say it anymore, but yeah. who knows? No, you gotta just come up with a list of things. And when you panic and you have nothing else, you just go through the list of things. And hopefully by the time you're done with the list, you've come up with something and radio <clears throat> when, like when I first started, that's what we call them crutches, right? It's like, it's your crutch. You keep doing the same thing. And mine was the phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And I would say the phone number for 104.7 K duck, like, uh, I don't know, six times in, in two minutes. You know, nobody needs a phone number that much. You say it once or twice and you move on. But I was like, triple eight. Oh, what was the number? Um, I still uh, have the one from K, uh, from KFly. I don't know what K-Ducks was. Something one of four, something, something K-Duck. Damn it. Now it's going to drive me crazy. I usually, <laughs> usually once you get into the mode, you remember it. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but if I go like one of 4.7 K-Ducks, Tanner and Drew's primetime party, uh, Three, four, six, one, four, seven. Oh, shit. I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> I'm giving well, you a plug, Val. While you're doing that, and Val's actually, she's, uh, oh, she's yeah, on yeah, your yeah. old she station now. now. Yeah, yeah, she, she works, works for 1015 KFly, which uh, we used to do. The Donkey Show was mentioned in the intro together on that station. And if I'm not mistaken, still a taxi cab floating around here with the old Donkey Show logo and the 1015 KFly Oregon's Real Rock logo on it. And it is, I think we've been out of that studio now for going on six years. So, um, a long you, time. Yeah. Long time. By the way, that number, uh, by the way, it's 541 345 1047. If you want to get a request into the, to Chino in the, in the, what is it, the morning house party? Yeah. Call up Chino in the house party. I'm sure he'd, uh, just by looking at his Facebooks, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard, I haven't talked to him in a while. We're, we're Facebook buds, but, uh, it's been a while since we spoke. Isn't that kind of weird that that's it's almost how what Facebook has turned into uh, with family and friends and also colleagues? Like, I find these people on Facebook all the time that are my friends, and I'm like, where do I know that guy from? And I start to look through, like, their info on their account, and I realize, oh, I worked with him nine yeah. years ago at a random place, you know? And it's just the way that we stay in touch, I guess, but we don't. 
I saw a meme today that said, uh, uh, it was like, I think it was that picture of, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, where he's like holding up a wine glass and like giving a toast. Uh -huh. And it said, here's to the people who are, who I've never met in person, but support me via memes, you know, <laughs> liking my memes and stuff. It, it was worded better. I just ruined the whole thing, but the whole, the idea is there. You get the idea. Well, one theme that we like to keep moving on the man room, um, even though this this whole thing is like brand new, it's going to be something that I force down everybody's throat. And that's to talk just a little bit about what we're drinking tonight. Um, I know that mm -hmm. uh, it's very important for me anyway to just have a little bit of beer in me. And it really kind of makes this thing fly out of me a little bit better. So the true words of an alcoholic. Right there. <laughs> what did you bring to the party tonight? You know what I drink? I drink Coors Light and I love it. Yeah. You Silver know, Bullet. Got, I bought eight. I bought an 18 pack of uh, Coors Light. That's why we're a little late because I was late. I was I realized I had no beer and I panicked. <laughs> so I ran to the store, and I I used to drink bottles like for years. I would just drink. I would just buy the bottles, but I have a problem returning my bottles. And so I don't know if you've seen the picture of the wall of Coors Light that I have in my in my garage. I've chipped uh, chipped away at it a little bit over the over recent months, but. You know, I, the, the bottles are just too heavy and it's just too much. So I just started getting cans because they're easy, easier to return. Yeah, they you store know, a even little easier. I, I, I prefer the taste out of a bottle, you know? Right. I like Coors Light. People give me shit for it. Uh, I enjoy it if there's not Coors Light, a Bud Light. I like light drinks. I don't like hoppy drinks. I don't like dark beer. I don't like ciders. Uh, I don't like hard alcohol, really. Um, so, yeah, I drink the bitch beer, and I don't care what you think. I actually don't think that's a bitch beer. I feel like Coors Light's like the guy's, the guy's light beer, just like the everyman's beer. It is beer. the number one selling beer in the state of Oregon, or at least it was last time I checked. But <laughs> at, 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 last time I backed this point up, it was the number one selling beer in the state. So people can eat my ass. I mean, I, right I, now, though, because I haven't showered today. I love my uh, my micro brews just as much as the next guy with a beard and a flannel shirt on. Uh, but I've drank enough Coors Light in my day to uh, definitely sink a ship. And that's always <laughs> my go to tailgate beer when you're out like drinking for eight hours. You can't drink IPAs all day before a football game and then go watch. one. Yeah, that's but, a lot. But you can with Coors Light, you know, and you kind of sip them. And even if they get a little bit warm, it's not yeah. bad. You know, you just kind of put it back. I think that's another reason I drink Coors Light or Bud Light is because I, I drink a lot and when I start to drink and I like to pound them, you know what I mean? So uh, I can I can drink 12 of these over the course of six hours and it's right. not a big deal. Right. And you won't commit you know? a felony afterwards, which is nice. Like that's, <laughs> right. that's the important thing. Right. You're I still making memories. make some crazy purchases on Amazon in the middle of the night, but that's <laughs> that's the extent of it. Yeah, I uh, I brought an IPA today. I'm drinking a Breakside Wanderlust, uh, Breakside a Brewery from up there in Portland where you're at, one of my favorites. Um, I don't need to get too far in depth into the IPA that I'm drinking because over the course of this show, I'll drink plenty of them and we'll have plenty of conversations about them. I yeah. actually wanted to bring well, up something. Well, I'm almost done with my first one here, uh, so I'll be opening up another one here in a second. That's perfect. I, I love the flow of this so far. We're, we're like five minutes <laughs> in, and you're already finished with your first. That's exactly what I want for this podcast. Uh, I found. I want you to say some stupid shit when you're faded. <laughs> I That's found how I get a, the hits. a new lane of of booze here just the other day, and it's not. The, I'm I'm way late to this party because we got a lot of friends. My wife, everybody likes these things, but. Last night, I was thinking about getting some Coors Light because I wanted something light, and instead, I picked up a 12-pack of hard seltzer, White Claw, right? Yeah, I saw that you said that. I, was, I didn't think you drank White, White Claw. Because I, really, I remember I asked, you, I asked you for an idea for a joke once. I go, Marcus, I need, you know, I, I'm trying to make fun of somebody who drinks a, a bitch beer or something. Give me a, give me a, a, a drink that people would make fun of. With the, without hesitation, you said White Claw. <laughs> and Drew got offended because he drinks White Claw, but it was funny, so I used the joke. Well, I, I'm, I, I guess I'm an equal opportunity offender in that right because I drank a whole half rack of those things last night. Well, not last night. It was like I started pretty early in the day because, you know, the wife's gone this weekend and I just had nothing to do. So I yeah. started playing video games and drinking White Claw. Good combination. Oh, but I hope you wiped your balls all over the couch. Dude, I'll tell you, though, the, they kind of snuck up on me because last night yeah. you and I were actually we were playing video games and we were BSing over over Discord and just uh, enjoying our Friday night. And our plan was to finish our conversation and then play some video games. And in the time we <laughs> finished our conversation and I got downstairs, I was so loaded that I couldn't see straight. <laughs> And I, I played like half of a round. Oh, I got killed immediately. I just, I think I might've yeah. even hurt myself. We're playing PUBG. I might've just dropped out of the sky and died without even getting shot. <laughs> I, it honestly could have happened. I don't remember, but 
Yeah. I'm a little surprised that I was able to put back 12 of those because it was yeah. sometime in the middle of the night. I walked to the fridge to get another one and the box was empty. And that's a I know. bad realization. The exact same thing happened to me last night. And went, okay, it's time to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> We're bad influences Holy on crap. one another, man. That really bad real. influences on one another. Um, but we have been yeah, for that, years, dude. Yeah. And it's a, uh, it's it's cool to finally have this thing come like full circle. Um, you and Drew, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you. Thank you. You and Drew are up in Portland um, and absolutely killing it in the mornings on 105.9 The Brew. You can hear them uh, weekdays from six to ten a.m. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm just, dude. I'm hold so on, hold on. Before before you get into that, hold on. All right, there you go. I love the effect. Uh, I'm so happy for you guys being uh, back in your hometown. You know, we spent a lot of years uh, working down here in Eugene. I was on the show for eight years. You and Drew actually did the show for 12 years together. And Drew and I had a couple of years on that show just uh, by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And God, was it only t only t I wasn't sure how many years I was on because I kind of a blur. Well, so it's tw thank you. 12 years. <laughs> I didn't really know. That's just K fly. I don't know how many years you guys were doing the, the primetime party on K duck before I even met you. Uh, I think it was I a few years, right? Show, I think it was a year and a half, maybe close to two years. It was, I think it was closer to a year and a half. And then we got fired for having somebody eat cat poop, <laughs> which really, if they're willing to do it, I don't understand why it's such a big deal. Everybody gets yeah. all buttered it was, about it. It was Sick Boy. Yeah. Who, I, I I did not get the pleasure of working with Sick Boy very much. I, in oh, fact, I, I was, think you that were pre, uh, I, you were post Sick Boy. Huh? Yeah, I met him, but I didn't, I didn't ever get to really work in the studio with him while he was, you know, breaking walls yeah. and eating poop, throwing up on mics and the like. The, um, the best way for me to kind of gauge the time, you know, if I'm, tri if I'm thinking of a donkey show memory, you know, I'll try to like, okay, what, what year is that? Okay. Is that before the Bud Light Studio sponsorship? No, oh, okay, that was that was before before we had the wrap, so the studio looked like shit. Uh, okay, so that was around this year, you know. And then so I I kind of gauge it by either who was there, like B Rock or Sick Boy or or you or um or Natalie or somebody, and then uh uh the way the studio wrap looked because if you ask me a year, I have no idea what happened during that year during the show. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I the only thing that kind of helps me line up what year it was is the Super Bowl bets because I can a lot of times remember how I felt during the game, how I felt after the game, and how I felt the next Monday, which was always the, the next day. You know, we always paid up our bets yeah. the week following the Super Bowl. So sometimes I can put those together, but it was just a big, long blur. I mean, it kind of happens when you're doing some variation of the same thing every day. It's kind of to be expected, you know, and... Um, we had a lot of fun, dude. It was my first kind of foray into radio that was anything other than on a volunteer basis. And um, you guys... I'll never forget. I, I don't remember how... Like, I don't remember the whole process because I just remember one day there was no Marcus and the next day he never left. <laughs> well, that's my strategy and, right there. That's how you, that, I call that my get a job strategy. <laughs> yeah, it was great because the memory that I have is uh, the first time we had you on the show was the Your Mama competition. I think you were on the phone and you had an insult battle. It was when the Yo Mama show was popular on MTV. That's right. Wilder Valderrama. So yeah, yeah uh, and then the, you guys had a, and you won, I think. It was really funny and you were just riffing. And I said, uh, I can't remember um, exactly if it, if it was on the air or off the air, but I said, hey, come down here. Maybe you asked. I can't remember how, but... Uh, I remember you were in the studio either the next day or the next week or something like that. And this is uh pre Bud Light studio rap. Yep. And all, I, the, all my, the only image I have is you in some really bright uh, zebra chewing gum looking sweatshirt. And you had a, uh, you had a, a 12 pack of Coors Light between your legs <laughs> and you just sat there for the whole show and drank <laughs> And I, well, I brought and it in for every you time guys. I looked over, you just, you just had that your hat backwards and you had one beer in your hand and you were just happy as a fucking you know, pig and slop. I, I will also say there was more to my, my little party box that I bought that day because I, I, if you remember, we 
when we would drink at the bars, we were uh, fans of something called Grow Ups, which is what we called uh, Jaeger Bombs. Oh. And that day, I also brought in a six pack of Red Bull and a fifth of Jaeger. And I really, I brought that stuff all for you guys because just what I heard on the radio and how you guys talked about your your various goings on, I kind of figured like, hey, I'll bring in a, I'll bring in a six pack of beer and we'll drink the beer together. And then you guys didn't have one, and here I was in a radio studio I didn't belong in <laughs> drinking. So it was one of those things. It's like, if you guys are okay with me doing this, I have to stay here because this is who I am and nobody else really accepts it. So, <laughs> and also I can't drive right now. <laughs> yeah, I need a ride. Uh, but man, it was a start. And that was kind of when I look back at it and I think about it, that's always what I tell myself is like, yeah, I showed up and never left. Like I, it was kind of a dream come true. What happened was um, I went down to pick up the tickets that I had won from the, your mama's, your, your, your mama competition. Oh, is that how you ended up there? And you guys had said when, because you took my information off the air when I had called in to win or whatever, and and oh, uh, oh. Cooper, go on. You hey, you I'm had just told me <laughs> Tanner's dog's getting after him. Uh, you had just told me on the phone, like, yeah, just let us know or let the receptionist uh, know that you're here, and we'll come out and say hi to you and just meet you, you know. And um, I thought that that was really cool because I, of course, obsessed with your show at that point in time, and you guys came out and just said, Hey, what's up? And you're just like, you said it. I remember it perfectly. You said, Hey, you're a funny guy. You should come into the studio sometime. And mm -hmm. I was just like, when, like when, <laughs> when, when, and you, you, you know, we set up a date and that's the day that I showed up with the beer and the Jaeger and everything. And, uh, yeah, never really left. And, and yeah, uh, it was great. And it, I don't know how long it took for us to get you hired, but it, it, I know it was a. I know it took longer than we wanted. Well, it was, uh, it was a while, and then there was like, yeah. there was a uh, there was some part time stuff that came uh, about. I was also waiting tables at Applebee's, uh, which was oh, I remember that. I remember hating your jobs. boss at Applebee's more than you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can talk some shit, dude. If you get me in a room with just a focus of talking about a person, I can really, I can really yeah. do some things to other people's opinion of that person. So, um, yeah, I, uh, Marcus would tell us stories of, of, of the way she would act and I would just get enraged. Like I go, Who, you point her that you point this bitch out. <laughs> I was always so mad and I'd never even met her, but I just, I got a problem with, um, people who, you know, uh, abuse their authority on such low levels like you work at an applebee's you know you're in charge you don't need to be a dick to people these are these are a lot of people just kids trying to make their way in school or or you know some people just trying to pay rent you don't need to be an asshole just because you're the manager sarah <laughs> yeah and and this one actually had a real special case of that uh privilege because she started as a dishwasher which is the lowest profession you can have at applebee's and she worked her way all the way up to managing oh, so her she's own gonna restaurant. give you the story about success oh yeah we really need to know how much you learned in the dish pit let me tell you uh but <laughs> you know i was coming in a lot and and one of our old bosses who you you've had you know he still work for him i think from time to time sarge um he told me something that was like yeah, i work with him i work with him daily it, he wasn't trying to be a dick because the guy doesn't really do that but he he was he was trying to give me uh, kind of a straightforward answer because I was yet again in his office begging him for work. And he goes, listen, you have the talent, you have the drive, you have the technical skills, but you don't have the opportunity, dude. <laughs> I was like, well, fuck, man, that's Whoa. the only thing that you can provide. <laughs> like, that's why I'm here. And that whole thing, I remember that was before I had been given really any work. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I, sh I got like 25 hours worth of work at the radio station, which for a dude that was working part time, that was way more than I was putting it at Applebee's. So I was already looking to quit that fucking job. And yeah. It was like three weeks later, everything fell apart and they cut my hours in half. <laughs> I was back down to like 10 hours a week or something. And I, I mean, it, this goes so far as to there was one hour up for grabs for us to be uh, for to either go to one of the part timers or me on the radio show. And we had like a week long debate battle over who was going to get that one hour of ten dollars and 50 cent pay or something like that. So it was serious back then. But uh, it, it's all kind of come full circle now. And you know, I'm, I'm unemployed and doing this thing from my house. So this is, this is a lot of fun. And I, if it doesn't well, go I'm anywhere, glad it doesn't employed because we get more <laughs> stuff like this from you. So yeah, thank God Marcus doesn't have a job. Well, and you know, <laughs> we can get into that grenade, uh, sometime later, but how do you explain really... that to your wife? How do you explain that to your wife? Cause I would, ex I would, I would assume that it might be the same thing, like telling your mom, you want to be an actor <laughs> or you want to be a rock star, you know? 
You know what I told her? Um, and this is actually something I've really kind of just been telling myself too, is like, if not now, when, like if I'm, I had kind of an opportunity uh, to possibly end up up in Portland with you and drew uh, earlier in the year that kind of fell apart. That was beyond our control. Yeah. yeah and, it's just a 2020. Thing. Yeah. And when that happened, I just kind of looked at Ashley and I said, that's my wife. And I said, look, I'm 36 years old. If I don't chase my dream now in every way, shape, and form that I can, then I'm never going to. We're going to turn the corner on 40, and I'm going to need to go get a job at the fucking post office or something yeah, so man. I can retire, you know? You got to Eminem lose yourself, that shit, <laughs> all right? And and that's why it's – and actually, the way that I phrased it to her is I said, honey, bald guys don't chase their dreams very often. And as you can see, I'm running out of dream chasing material up on top. So we need to get this <laughs> thing moving. And, dude, she's great. I, I mean, she – the nice thing about my wife is it, we might just be plummeting into a volcano and we don't know it, but she's on, she's there and she's going to do it with me. And she's had faith she's on in the me ride. and stuff. So, and you know, I'm going to die. I met her because of the radio show. She was a fan of the donkey show and came in because I was sniffing after her on MySpace one day. And she's, <laughs> you know, she friended me because of that show. And, and here we are, you know, 13 yeah. years later married. So, um, it definitely is something that it really is important to me because she doesn't necessarily like to vet all my material. Cause what's happened now that I'm working from home and I'm building all this stuff at home, she comes home from work. And the first thing I want to do is slam all my creative stuff in her face and ask her what she thinks about it. Yeah. While Overloader. also, yeah. While also being the worst person in the world at taking criticism, um, which is really just a recipe for not having your wife be happy with you every day when she gets home. So, um, I'm really excited for this podcast to finally launch and get off the ground so she can listen to all this stuff because I have spared her, uh, in the last few weeks of, of just drilling her with all of it because yeah. she finally looked at me and was like, why do you care what I think? Like, do what you know how to do and just go out there and have fun with it. And it'll turn out better than what I'm going to tell you. But so. that's, that's what a lot of people don't understand about what we do or what, people in entertainment do you know um conan o'brien uh was telling a story uh you know conan is one of my favorites and he was telling a story about when lauren michaels hired him to do the show and he said that uh he goes you know lauren michaels hired me so i just i figured i was the funniest candidate i was the best i was the best guy for the job and he goes uh he says to lauren he goes so i was the funniest guy that's why you hired me right and lauren says no you weren't the funniest you were the nicest and that plays longer and even though that's a really good compliment Conan was crushed because all yeah. he heard was you weren't the funniest. And, and in our job, in our business, you know, like if we get, if someone in radio gets fired, if they say, Oh, your ratings aren't good and we got to let you go. It's like, Oh, you just, my, that just, that's my personality you're talking about because that's what radio is supposed to be. You're supposed to be warm and inviting on the air and be honest and, and, um, and, you know, uh, just kind of, uh, bare your soul. And, um, Sorry, I got distracted with something. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, I get it though. It's like somebody telling you that you suck, not your ratings. Yeah. You, you can't, re you can't right. separate so yourself. Even, even, even though, even though it's like, you, you know, they don't mean it that way. You, it, you take it so personally because you just told me you don't like me. Right is basically how I take it, you know. Because if like, oh, I didn't like today's show. Well, that I just bared my soul. <laughs> you don't like me is what I is what I'm hearing. You know what I mean? So I, I get that. So uh, even though that's not the way people when they say things like that that's creative people feel that way we, you know we, we all have some insecurities inside of us because that's uh that's what it, that's what it's all about you know actors are insecure little bitches yeah musicians um you know creative yeah. people in general and it's funny because you know i my wife i think she understands that but she also is an artist she does a lot of, of sculpting and drawing and painting and stuff like that and if i wish i had what she has because if somebody were to look at her painting and be like Hey, that kind of sucks up there in the left corner, whatever you were trying to do with that mountain. She'd just be like, well, you just don't understand it. Fuck wad, you know, and yeah. like, you don't know. <laughs> right. But she uncultured swine, but she was, she's, um, almost immune to it. Now, not everybody's immune, but she has a real tough outer exterior show where she just has confidence in what she creates me. For some reason, I don't have any of that shit. I, I create it and it might be good and I'll hate it because I created it. I also will fall in love with yeah. it and not want to change it because I can't take criticism, but. Um, I, I just, I need to develop a little bit of a, of thicker skin because one thing about it, man, you're trying to take entertainment professional. People are going to tell you right on your nose, whether or not they like it or whether or not it works for them. And 
you know, you yeah. got to decide if you're going to, if you're going to learn and grow from that, or if you're going to let it crush you into a little puddle. So you want to know uh, what helps with uh, thick skin, mean little kids. I started <laughs> on, we know my first, you know, uh, radio gig was on top 40 radio, right? K duck Z 100 in Portland, stuff like that. And the majority of those listeners are, are female and young and, uh, and moms. And so I would, I, you know, you'd go on the radio and little girls, 13 years old, don't give a fuck. <laughs> they're like Eminem. They'll just say whatever comes to their mind and they are mean. And they'll say, they, dude, when I first started at my full, my, you know, I was doing weekends and stuff, but when I first started doing radio every single day for like a show and I was the guy every night, uh, kids can say the meanest things and it would crush me. And it took me, you know, six months, a year to just adjust to like, you know what? This is just little shit. That kid's probably going to regret that when they're old or whatever. It doesn't even matter what they say. It's just a little kid, but it just, that, that helped me develop the, you know, thick skin was just because kids are fucking awful. <laughs> they were just so terrible, which is, it's interesting because what I think of when you, when you say that is I think about the kids that start in entertainment at that age, that 13 year old years old, maybe they got popular on YouTube, or, me. you know, and, and, Oh yeah. Yeah. Not like that, but yeah, no. right. What yeah, the, these you. kids that blow up to a point where, you know, they've got 50,000 TikTok followers for every six yes. second video. And right. it's, it, it makes me think, well, maybe they can stay immune to all of the noise for a certain amount of time because they're at the age where that noise just comes at them all the time. And every single foray into social media for them is a battle with Becky the bitch from, you know, homeroom or, or, or Stan the asshole on the football team. Like kids are just constantly at war with one another and developing their personalities. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got these, these young, like high schoolers that are churning out millions and millions of dollars and followers on, on the various networks. And I don't know, it's just interesting to me. I would not have been able to handle it as a 13 year old. I, when I was 13, um, like computer games and probably picking my nose were up on the top of the priority yeah. list. And I don't Play know an Oregon trail. <laughs> I don't know how these kids can focus and do it. I, now it's probably a function of them being born with it and brought up with it and having a device in their hand from a young age. Yeah. But, see, we remember a time before all that shit happened. Exactly. I mean, it, it's funny you said Oregon Trail, but what I was thinking is about when I was 13, I was playing the first multiplayer online RPG that I'd ever played. It was called, what was that? It's called Ultima Online. And it was just, it was a, you know, a Wizards, and it was kind of like World of Warcraft, but it was one of the first ones. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy, I, I, but I'm looking at it thinking... There's no way I would have used that computer to do anything uh, like make money. Like, I wasn't even thinking about any of that shit. In fact, if my dad asked me to go do chores at that time, I was like, I don't need the five bucks. You can keep it, you know? And uh, so <laughs> it's, yeah. it's weird to me. It, yeah. It's just the world is changing, man. And it's it's funny because tech they say technology um, it advances. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Exponentially. And I, I kind of feel like society's starting to do that alongside of technology. There's these big expo exponential changes that make right, you and think I about what think about what humans have accomplished in the last 100 years compared to what you know what we've done since humans can you know we're able to document history, right? Like, like we in the last 100 years, so many things have changed. The human brain is all of a sudden firing at all sorts of different cylinders because you got you know so much information coming at you at once i mean just look at our news you know when you look at cnn or fox or whatever you've got the news anchor doing their thing you've got a banner at the bottom you got a scrolling ticker below that you got something on the top left that tells you where there's what city they're in something on the top right that tells you that they're live and that you know that there's another weather report coming up you got a, a little hurricane box on the right and there's a little another box on the left that tells you how many deaths have, have been caused by coronavirus so far it's just so much at once and then on top of that you got the news story that the actual anchor is giving you right so it's just so much at once and think about that humans have been around for a long ass time and only you know just recently did we start doing all of that at once right and it is interesting that that uh you know you wonder if like if there was some sort of time machine and if like a kid from a 15 year old kid from 2021 were to go and talk to a 15 year old kid from, you know, uh, to, you know, 1901, what the difference would be like that, 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 that kid from 1901 is probably a lot tougher. Let's just be honest. It's probably a lot tougher, you know, probably has our, he's probably married with three children at 14, you know, like they just, <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, you know, like they, the, the difference is there. It's just so, it's just interesting to me. And, and um, you know, in a hundred, 200 years, it's going to be cool to see the science when they actually figure it out, you know, like what's actually doing to our brains. Yeah. And, all this information at once. Well, you know, I've been watching a lot of broad or a lot of documentaries and, and sometimes these, these true crime documentaries or whatever will have news reports from like the eighties or the seventies when these things were going down. And when you're watching these little short clips of news reports, the only thing I'm thinking is, wasn't everybody on cocaine back then? Can we fucking speed this up yeah. a little bit? Like, give yes. me something more. And that's because, like you said, I've had it slammed in my face for the last 20 years. So much information yeah. that when you just see a, a, a lady right. just drinking, you know, or just drinking, I'm drinking. You just see a lady reporting a news story. <laughs> it's boring. It's like you're not getting enough. You're not getting you what need you're more. Used to. I need more. Exactly. I mean, when, how often do you sit there and watch a movie? And just sit there and do nothing but watch the movie. I'm usually watching the movie and I'm on my phone. Yep. I sometimes will have my laptop and I'm playing video poker. Like I'm just doing all this at once. Uh, speaking of cocaine, you just mentioned cocaine and it got me thinking about the story. Hold on. Three. Tier three. We're in number three. I like so, it. Uh, this story came out uh, just, I think, last week, maybe the week before. Um, but uh, Ozzy and the rest of the guys from Sabbath were talking to the Rolling Stone. And I guess back in 1972, uh, when they were recording volume four, they spent $75,000 on cocaine, 75 K on cocaine and smuggled it on a private airplane to the uh, location they were recording. Here's the thing. It only cost 65,000 to record volume four. <laughs> so they outspent their, uh, their recording budget on cocaine is what you're saying. <laughs> but yeah. And back then, they, you know, it was just kind of a thing not a big deal. Like companies and record, record companies look, would look over it. I read this biography about James Cameron, the, the director. And back in the eighties, you know, and probably the seventies too, uh, even before that, um, studios would budget in cocaine for the crew because they're working, you know, 18 hour days. And so they would write it into the actual budget. <laughs> It's like we can't I mean, get a they Folgers would disguise it as something, but yeah, we can't get a Folgers budget around here. So let's go ahead and bring in the, <laughs> just a little bit of candy makes you dandy. Get that <laughs> Colombian Bam Bam, a whole truck of it. We, these guys are working a long shift, oh, man. 18 hour shift. That's great. Hey, uh, speaking of stories that just came out since uh, we can be a little bit topical on this podcast, because why not? Um, did you hear about Kim and Kanye. This is going to be a big yeah. deal in the entertainment industry for a while. Kim uh, Kim Kardashian has filed for divorce from Kanye West. Uh, effective, I believe, February 19th was when the news broke. And uh, it's crazy, man, because there's already, like, this story broke yesterday, and there's already a story out of, like, somebody has basically leaked that Kanye is sulking right now. And he's saying yeah. that he's in, they're saying that he's in the, if I only phase. And right now his biggest, if I only was, if I only had won my bid for president, oh, I wouldn't God. have been cost or I wouldn't have lost my marriage. <laughs> oh, here, Kanye, if you only continued to take your medication, you would still <laughs> yes. be married. Yeah. That, I mean, and I, and I feel bad for him. Um, I mean, only, only to an extent uh, because he's, you know, Filthy rich and probably doesn't really appreciate it or take it for granted, I guess. Um, but I, I feel bad for people who are 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 that famous and that rich, and you can clearly tell that they're slowly starting to lose uh, like some sense of reality or a grip on reality because the guy obviously, and I'm not a doctor, and I really shouldn't, uh, you know, sit sit here and say that he's got a medical condition. But I, it, to me, it's clear that he's got some mental issues, right? And I feel like nobody can tell him anything. He's not going to listen to anybody. He's rich and he's powerful and everyone around him a yes man. And I feel like he's never going to, that alone is going to keep him from, from getting healthy. Just, just, just the fact that of this, just his life, the situation that he's in or any of these people. Right. Marcus, did I lose you on the, uh, I thought it's a video feed. Yeah, I think the video feed might be uh, messing up, but we can still keep going for audio. I'll try to get you back in here, but um, that's fine. It, it with Kanye, I have trouble because I feel sorry for him too. Because I do think you're right. I think there's there's a, a mental health issue there that maybe is going untreated or at least not being appropriately treated. Um, the the thing that really I always it always crops up in the back of my mind is like, dude, you were always that guy that is, um, you know, the dude that 
basically is going to or wants to do whatever he he wants, and he's always going to be the uh, the guy that flies against the grain. He's always going to be the dude that is uh, way over the top. You know the whole the whole nine yards with Kanye, and so when he goes out and he does things that are Kanye. And they end up not being, you know, a good thing for him. It's like, well, dude, you kind of have to make your own bed and sleep in it here because you've been Kanye West your entire career and it's got you where you're at now. And now you continue doing Kanye West and that's what gets you to where you are yeah, yeah. now, you know? Yeah. And it, like the same thing with Bam. Exactly. Margera. Bam Margera was another one that we talked about. Um, He's I, the one I feel, honestly, Kanye can fucking eat a dick. <laughs> Bam is the guy who I feel bad for. Yeah. Uh, you know, because that dude, he never grew up. You know, even when I like I watched that video of him having that meltdown that he deleted, I was like, dude, he doesn't see what we're all seeing. You're acting like you're 14, ma'am. You're like 40 or whatever the whole... He's probably old than that. How old is he? How old is Bam Margera? Oh, he's. I think he's in his mid-40s at the very least, if I'm not mistaken. So, it's like, man, you really can't like... It's time to grow up, dude. You know, like, yes, the movie's called Jackass, but it doesn't mean you need to be a dumb shit, like, constantly. Not every meltdown in your life needs to be uh, in public eye. I learned that the hard way. Yeah. You know, I used to just throw every single story in my life on the air. I mean, to the most, for the most part, I still do. It's probably, you know, 80% of my life is on the air, you know, 75, I guess, but... Um, there's you know, discretion. He, you have to use a little he, bit of discretion. Otherwise, you can't be a normal person, I don't feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not healthy to, to do that. No. you it's really not. And, and you know, everybody, it's fun at first. Like, that's one of the things that I learned on the Donkey Show was like, wow, I can come in here and just talk about stuff that happened to me, and it can, you know, people can relate to it, and it is maybe... It's kind of uh, therapeutic, you know? Exactly. It feels good to get it out there exactly. and to be heard. Yep, you feel like you're venting a little bit, and the thing is, though, a lot of the times those stories that you tell are not the, like to be relatable. It's not going to be the best story. You might not come out on top of of what happened every single time, but you still feel like it's relatable. It's like, hey, you win some, you lose some. But sometimes you feel like maybe you've just told too many losses in a row. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, I need to drink more. Hold on. <laughs> <I'm just> gonna... <laughs> So mm. it's something that we mm. talked about a little bit last night too. That while you're getting your next beer, I wanna I wanna bring up again because this happened to me just the other day, and I was super butthurt about it when it happened. But now I'm actually not butthurt at all, and I kind of feel bad for even saying anything on Facebook. But I made a stupid joke, just a post that I made the other day, and here like. I don't know, 18 hours or so after I made the post, I'm just scrolling through my timeline on Facebook, and here is my post in a different font on somebody else's uh, timeline as if oh. they had written the joke and posted it right there. And so hmm. I, like, my very first, and I don't know why I got so possessive of it, but my very first thought was, like, I'm going to call this dude out. And so I went and took a screenshot of my original post, and then I shared it in his comment section, and I said, are you going to give me credit? And the guy was, like, super apologetic, and he was really nice. He's like, oh, I thought it was funny, man. It's hilarious. Like, yes, you get credit for it. And then he asked me about this podcast. He's like, when's the podcast launching? And that I kind of felt a little uh, bit bad because well, I... Yeah, I'm going to take his side because, you know what, that's flat. It's like you just got memed. You exactly. know, you did something great, and people wanted to share it. You know, I share memes all the time. Like, uh, I, I share... Like, you have, uh, let me pull this. Oh, here's my phone. Um, I, this meme that I saw... Um, on Facebook, I, it, you can clearly tell somebody wrote it on Twitter, but they just cropped out the person's name. And, you know, yeah, that would irritate me. But at the same time, like, you wrote that. And that should feel good. You know, like, he thought that was funny. You just got memefied. You know how hard it is to get memed? <laughs> you know? and like, Because <laughs> really when, when it happens, it's like, you know, it's got to be natural and organic. And, and, and uh, you know, and that means it was funny. Yeah, and and I sh stop and, being a little bit. <laughs> like like I said, now that I've had a day or two to like think not only about just what happened, but the way I reacted to it, it it makes me feel like there's a lot more um, merit in you know you you get a lot of these famous people. I think Joe Rogan is probably the biggest one that says it all the time, but he he doesn't read any of his comments. Like he'll post something and he'll never it's, read any of the reactions. Talk about talk about mental health avoid the comments yeah exactly and and i should have just i should have done that with that i should have avoided the timeline in that whole situation because you're right he's looking at it as a form of flattery that dude was a fan i think of the of the old donkey show 
And that's because I don't recognize him. He's friends with me on Facebook, but I don't, his name doesn't ring any bells, you know, and, and no offense to him. I just, I don't there know who go. he is. I wouldn't be able to pick him out of a crowd. And I, I was, like I said, I was super possessive, but it does kind of suck because that's the nature of the internet on pretty much everything but YouTube. Right. If you want to steal somebody's shit and call it your own, the internet's like, whatever. This is the internet. I mean, when we tried to sell that Virgin Mary pretzel, I mean, it was within hours, it was copied. It went from one Virgin Mary pretzel on eBay to three or four or five pages of Virgin Mary pretzels on eBay. Yes. I mean, it was the, the duplicates were just they were just straight up taking our photo and, and, and doing it. So, yeah, the Internet, you're just not going to have control of it. And think of it like, you know, think of it as that as a compliment. Let's you know, talk you about the, the joke. Sorry, let's talk about the Virgin Mary pretzel a little bit. I completely I should have had that written down as, as a definite talking point for this podcast because that is, I think, one of the I think that's the closest that I've ever been to being involved in something that was truly viral. As in like people yeah, in different fun. countries knew about it. Um just to catch hang on a second. I got uh, uh I've been waiting there on that one is. for like five minutes. Um, just to catch people up, if you don't know this, when we were on the donkey show in Eugene, one of the people that worked at the radio station had found a pretzel in a bag of rolled golds. And it looked like, a like one of the, um, you know, holy sculptures of the Virgin Mary. And it was, it had this, and it was right, right around the time where people were seeing like a couple of, maybe a year, maybe a couple of months before this, somebody saw what they thought looked like the Virgin Mary in some some uh, grilled or some uh, toast, a, a grilled cheese sandwich. Yep, yep. And there was also Michael Jackson was seen in like a waffle or a chicken breast or something. Is you're <laughs> right. It was it was something that was happening. And this pretzel bore a resemblance to a picture of the Virgin Mary that was almost uncanny. And so, for a radio bit, we slapped the thing up on eBay. Um, and you're right. Within within mere hours, CNN uh, picked it up. Yeah, the news was all over it, and then when the news got all over it, the copycats came out in droves. And you can actually still find some of them on eBay. There's still Virgin Mary pretzel things. They're they're really deep, and you got to search for a long time. But there was a dude selling replica Virgin Mary pretzels that he would take dough and he would make you rather than a little rolled gold one he would make you like a like a big ballpark pretzel sized replica of the virgin mary pretzel then he would wrap it unbaked ship it to you and then you could bake it and have yourself the virgin mary pretzel now we got our posting which at the time uh had a bit of 1.6 million dollars on it we got it removed <laughs> because we were quote selling food and that violated yeah. ebay's um ebay's uh, terms and standards or terms and conditions right. however the goddamn copycat guy who was actually selling you something that you should eat uh w he was still on ebay for like years after that and who knows how much money that guy made there was a dude making t-shirts i mean it, it was yeah. crazy and <laughs> I, that's i remember it was on t-shirts i do remember that it's fucking crazy <laughs> because out of the the pro my hugest gripe with the internet is the people that put all the work into all that shit which was you and drew and i got nothing out of it and all the people that profited are the ones that actually piggybacked it. Like we never got we never yeah, made a yeah, cent yeah. off of that press. Never yeah, we never made any money. And the guy who uh had it, uh the dude that sued me, he ended up I think he told me he put it it was either he even put I think he put it in a safety deposit box, like actually at the bank. Well, I, do you remember where he was keeping it before that? When he showed it, it was to like us. an arcade machine. Yeah, he had bought an old arcade machine that had the little locking door where you can empty the coins out, and he was hiding it in there like somebody was going to break in and try to steal it. It's a fucking pretzel, and it obviously didn't have any value. Yeah. Otherwise, we would have been probably not having this conversation on my unemployed podcast, and maybe I don't know, being on a beach somewhere, being a couple proper investments removed. You know, I, I don't you know. know. What's but, weird about that. Uh, by the way, you can type in Virgin Mary Pretzel in YouTube, and it's the very first video that pops up. Yeah. Uh, the news story. Um, it's like I said, and I, I was just weird. A I have part like, of it. I have no anger towards him. Can and we? You'd think that I would because I got sued and lost my job and had to move across the country for two years, but I have like, I have no anger. And it, I never really, I think I probably did at first, but like, I never really was super angry at him. I was, I think I was ang more angry at the company than I was. Him. I mean, I don't that, know if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense because of the way that the, the whole thing went down. Um, because, you know, you we were all in the studio on a Thursday and that's when you got served the papers. And I remember it because you brought the papers in and just slammed them on the desk and we're like, I'm being fucking sued. 
<laughs> and we all started looking through all the documents and everything. And Friday, that was on a Thursday. Friday, I was due to leave. Ashley and I were flying to Las Vegas for the weekend. And I was just going to work like a half day. And I came in at, you know, noon or one and they pulled the fucking trigger. I mean, it was a very. This was uh, this is a crazy thing, too. They fire me on a Thursday and then they replayed me on Friday. Right. Yeah, because I was they leaving. fired me and then they continued to like replay the show. I was like, what the hell? And and dude, it was it was one of those things where I, it it and not this is not your fault. Is the only per- people at fault here, I believe, are the people that were in power and made these decisions at the time. And I, it totally ruined that trip to Las Vegas because it was just like I, I I left Las Vegas being a producer on the show, and I came back from Las Vegas with the task of hosting it right after you, the person that yes. had create was half of creating it, uh, was unceremoniously fired for a reason we couldn't fucking talk about. That's the other thing that's tough is the donkey show was always known in this city in Eugene where we broadcast from and all uh, up and down the I-5 corridor for being honest. We weren't out there playing characters. We were talking about, like you were saying earlier, our lives and the things that happened to us. And the one biggest thing that's ever happened, they totally they totally shut us down, like straight up gag order. Don't talk about it or it's your job type shit. And oh, we couldn't oh, we couldn't say that. anything. And, and until you came back on the show to talk a little bit about it, what, two years later or maybe a full year later, nobody really knew anything because we couldn't, other than we could say, yeah, was he, they, yeah. the company got sued and Tanner got sued. And that's the tall and the short of it, you know, tune in at two yeah. o'clock tomorrow. And it, it was tough. And I've always wanted to ask you, is it, you don't feel any anger towards the person that sued you? Is it maybe that you feel or you feel absolved because he lost? Well, that definitely helps. You know what I mean? Like, if, <laughs> if he would have won that case, I would have been, I think that would have, because it's just bullshit. It was just a frivolous lawsuit, right? And, and I, if he would have won the case, I would have been like, what the hell? But the fact that he won, yeah. Or, I mean, so, sorry, the fact that we won, yeah. It makes, it's like, it makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, I mean, would I be friends with the guy again? No. <laughs> but, uh, but do I have like hatred or anger? I mean, like, no, because I don't, it was just kind of a desperate money grab and it was obvious. Right. And so, I, I mean, that's, it definitely that's helps thing. you. I, I don't, it definitely helps you feel it. And I think maybe the fact that you, you saw through it like that too. Like, yeah, it cost you your gig and it, it uprooted your life and ended with you moving all the way to fucking Detroit of all places. And, but the but the oh fact of the God. matter and, is you beat what, all of it. You know, I mean, you got you got the upper hand here. You definitely came out on top. I don't know what he's doing now, uh, but it's not competing with your gig. I can tell you that. <laughs> I hope he's doing. I hope he's doing all right. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing either. I um last I heard he he lost his job that that he had. I I think he was a a, a bellhop or something or. What was he, a bellboy? Yeah, there is a bell captain, I think. There's been some uh, weird some weird um, happenings. You know, I still live in the same city as the dude, and he used to frequent uh, kind of a greasy spoon little uh, cafe slash bar that is close to my house, and my wife and I would go sometimes on a Sunday morning and have brunch, or sometimes we'd go in there on a Friday night because they'd have live music, and he, a lot of the times, would be playing there, and what's weird about... And he's a fantastic drummer. I mean, he's a... Really good drummer. Yeah, and what was weird about that whole thing is that he made efforts to talk to everybody but me, and I think you. I don't. I don't know if he actually made an effort to talk to you, but he passed uh, Drew's wife a note one time at a restaurant that she worked at, trying to like have some half-assed apology. Um, he's he uh, talked to some of the other people that were involved with the show and stuff like that. But every yeah, I time, remember the note that he passed to Amy, Drew's wife, was. Better fired me, and, and I don't know why he keeps up with that because that that is literally the the, the point that he lost in court. <laughs> right. and how can I fire you? I wasn't the boss; was- I was the host of a radio show. I had absolutely no authority in terms of who gets hired or fired. It, you know, but he's he's ducked his head every single time I've seen him, and kind of almost shied away from me. like he thinks I'm going to punch him. He's like 20 years my elder. <laughs> if I if I hit him, at, even at 36 years old, I'd probably kill him in one punch. I'm not going to do that. I don't have yeah, I, that. Yeah. That spelled some some real uh, some real turmoil in my life too, but not anything nearly as bad as what it did for you and and the show in general and everything like that. So 
I don't hold a grudge to him, but I just think it's funny the people that do. There's one guy um, that we worked with. His name's Andy, and he's just one of the coolest dudes you'll ever meet. Oh, I love Andy. He was radio royalty back in the 80s, which you just love hearing all the old stories about. But yeah. shortly after yeah. the lawsuit came down and you were fired, um, this is before you moved to Detroit, Andy comes in the studio, and Drew and I are in there getting ready to do the show, and he's like, hey, so I was sitting at such and such restaurant the other night, and was in there. And he's like, he already sounds kind of like mad, you know? <laughs> and Andy's a little bit older guy too. I was like, fuck, did Andy fuck this guy up or something? You know what happened? And he, I guess what happened was Andy was just sitting there by himself eating or, or having a drink or something. And, and the guy that sued you walked up to him and was like, hello, and tried to be very cordial. And Andy just looked up at him. He goes, you get the fuck away from me right now. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a dude Andy's he works a, with. Andy's a soldier, dude. He Andy's one of those loyal guys that you could trust. You know, if he's on your team, you can trust him. Dude, he's an OG. An OG. Yeah. I love the dude. And my uh, my car, the, the Focus blew up in his apartment's parking lot one day. Um, and he was... He was helpful. It was very, I was glad that yeah. it was him and not somebody else from that station. So uh, it's it, funny, man. I'm glad. Yeah. I think that the uh, the listeners out there, um, whoever they may be, are going to get a lot out of this little segment where we talk a little bit about that because while we've had a few opportunities to kind of, you know, there's not really rumors or stuff like that, that the lawsuit and the two years after the lawsuit when Drew and I got fired are are some of those those two things that still in this town, like, I, I'm out and around and people talk about it. People will ask me about it, like straight up come oh, up really? to me at a Fred Meyer and be like, what happened? And I, you know, I, I don't give them. It is frustrating. We did. Uh, it is frustrating. We didn't get a full, like, um, you know, explanation. That's the shitty thing about radio is, you know, and, and especially with big companies is that companies make a decision and all of a sudden a personality will just disappear. Yep. No explanation, no reason. And it, you know, it sucks because the listener li listeners are sitting there going, what the hell? You know what I mean? This guy's been a part of my life for years sometimes. And all of a sudden he's just gone and you're just going to pretend like it never was there. Yep. You know, I, I wish there were, you know, and I understand why companies do it, but I wish there was, I wish there was a little bit more, um, uh, cause that's kind of a slap in the face of the listeners. I wish there was a little bit more to, you know, a little bit more respectful to the listeners. I'm getting a little pickled here, so I'm no, having trouble finishing sentences. So. It's all right, man. And I we don't have to go. <laughs> we're not going to go a lot longer here. But I think it's. Yeah, I think what I you said. I order is, pizza, Marcus, <laughs> or I'm going to pass out by ten. I think what you said carries a lot of weight because it's it. What you do see there is the lack of appreciation for the listener from the company, like the the overarching corporate entity that runs the radio station. Yeah, they the don't overlords. Give, right, they don't give a fuck about the little guy when that's all that the radio personality cares about is the guy that's listening to tunes in every day. And you know, there was after Drew and I got fired, there was a uh, um guy that called the show or called the radio station and asked to speak to the general manager who was behind the decision to fire us every goddamn day for like months after we got <laughs> fired so much so that the person that fired drew actually called him months later and was like, will you tell, will you call this guy off please? Because he's in my ear every right. day. And, and drew actually was, if I remember correctly, drew was like, I, I don't even know who you're talking about. Like we didn't know because we had no way to reach them because they uh, one thing that they did to Drew and I, which really, oh man, I, this really pissed me off. Um, I asked them point blank when we were signing our agreements, Carl and Drew and I, when we got fired, we had to sign a piece of paper that said we wouldn't go to the press for some reason. Um, yeah, and that too. was, yeah, and and that was the only way that they were going to give us a severance. Which <laughs> my severance was a fat seven hundred bucks. So see how long you can get along on that. <laughs> Um, they asked me to sign something, and I just said no. <laughs> see, and, and we should have, but when I was signing it, I looked up them, and I said, what are you guys going to do with the station? And they go, we are moving away from spoken word broadcasting completely, and we're, we're probably going to flip the format. And I said, okay, so you guys aren't going to, you're not going to try to recreate the donkey show with other people. And they said, no, we're completely done. And I said, okay, well, we want the Facebook page. Because our Facebook page had somewhere between twenty and 25,000 followers at that point. And it was something that we had worked on since fucking Facebook came around. You know, yeah. I mean, it I'm was, the one who I'm the one who opened it. Exactly. <laughs> and and so it was a lot of work I, and a lot of those people. And those were our, that was our captive little audience. Like we were going to be able to say what we wanted to say to those people. Like you were kind of saying, they'll cancel a personality and you'll never get to hear from them. 
Drew and I and Carl were all sitting at Drew's house typing out our, like, we can't believe this is happening. We love you guys all. We're so sorry. We wish that this didn't have to be this way, but look for us in the future. And all of us clicked post at the same time because we wanted them to all show up on the page at the same time. And everybody clicked post and everybody's phone flipped over and said, you are not allowed to post on this page anymore. And they had, in that time that it took us to write our goodbyes, they had pulled and changed the password, which... I should have done the minute that they told us that we got that that Facebook page. But so much was going on that day. And I actually have the audio of it, Tanner. I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day because I said some things I'm not too proud of. But I <laughs> we got on the phone with the general manager, the guy that fired us. And uh, Drew was being very professional. And he was talking to him and trying to reason with him and say, you don't have any need for this. Why don't you just let us have it? And at one point in time, the guy was just being ad nauseum and he just kept repeating himself like a dick. You know, when people give you an answer and they don't want to hear your rebuttal anymore, they don't want to argue with you. So they just keep saying the same sentence over and over again. He started to do that. And I just this rage overtook me and I just grabbed the phone from Drew and I just started fucking going off. And the last thing <laughs> that I said to him, because he kept calling the owner of the company, a person he referred to by his first name every day that I'd ever worked with him, he started calling this dude by Mr. and then his last name. And he was only using that. And I, I just was like, you can tell Mr. that he can kiss my fucking ass and hung up the phone. Like, that was the way I ended the phone call. Felt really good then. Not sure what it did for my professional prospects, as I am unemployed still at this point. Um, but <laughs> it was not the best, not the best thing. But whatever, man. No, but Yolo. that guy's that guy's not in the fucking industry anymore, so he can eat a dick, as far as I'm concerned. And it, I, look, it felt so good at the time, but it was funny because when I said that, you can tell him he could kiss my fucking ass and hung up the phone. Drew looked right at me and he goes, "We better go cash these severance checks," <laughs> and we went right to the bank. Uh, yeah, but like cancel that, yeah. dude, it's, uh, it, it sucks that, you know, some of the shit went down the way that it did, but I will say this. I've, I have two lifelong friends because of it, uh, in you and yeah. drew and, and the, and on, and, and, and I agree that's, uh, that's, I think that's a huge thing to, to take away. It's like, it was an experience that I wouldn't change for anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even change the way it ended. You know, um, yeah, I learned a lot from it. My career, the only, the only hard part was was just the transition from another from Oregon to Detroit. Right. It, my my career, if anything, it helped because you know I I I finally was able to take another step that I wasn't taking, or you know uh, it got people's attention. Uh, he if he thought he was gonna like destroy everything, it it really went the other way. Yeah. So, thanks. <laughs> right. Thanks, Dick. Uh, but yeah, and you know it doesn't end there. Um, they they did. There was a lot of decisions made, and I think by more than anything, I think by mostly one person. Um, you know, you talk about them not caring about the little guy. It kind of goes for uh, the personalities, too, because when they eventually fired Drew and I a couple years after they fired you, um, they fired Drew. I think he was less than one week away from having his first baby. And I was actually accepting the keys to the house that my wife and I had just bought the day that they fired us. And I'll oh, tell you, man. that's real. That's a real ominous feeling when you're looking your first ever mortgage payment in the face and you get fired 15 days before it's due. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure the bank, too, is like, oh, <laughs> fuck. Fortunately, the Damn bank God. was none the wiser because the paperwork was all through. And according to what they saw, I was employed. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, kind of got away there with the fast is. one there. But uh, it, like I said, man, um, I the, the relationships and all the experiences, I mean, uh, you it's, wouldn't change it for the world. It's weird when you can talk about like, well, what's what's like an experience you had on the radio show? OK, I'll, I'll go ahead and play. I was driving the uh, station vehicle up behind a party bus full of you and Drew and a bunch of strippers one time. And somebody threw a vibrating dildo out the window and landed on I-5 next to where I was driving. And I saw it <laughs> as clean as day. Where else? What other place in life are you going to get that type of experience? I mean, if you even get lucky enough to get on a bus with strippers you're probably not going to see one of them huck a dildo out the window. So, I mean, it's just one of those things that I, I'll never, I'll never uh, wish for anything different in that experience, man. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons that it's so important to me to have you and Drew on the Man Room podcast as a couple of the first ones, um, because I wouldn't be doing this stuff if it wasn't for you going all the way back to the beginning of the podcast, telling me, hey, you're funny, you should come in here sometime. 
And had you not made that suggestion, who knows where I would be today. I guarantee you it wouldn't be doing something that I, I really love and enjoy. Um, so, you know, it, it was, like I said, it was just super important to me to try to do what I can to pay back that because there's a lot of gratitude that lives within me for you guys and uh, the opportunity that you gave me and, and just the, uh, the experiences as well. Appreciate those words, bro. Uh, you're one of my favorite people of all time. Um, you know, you, uh, I, you're the only person I would say yes to a podcast to, and I will do it as many times as you would like. Um, you're one of my best friends and, uh, I'm really excited for you and, you know, um, and, and you're gonna, you're gonna do great. And, uh, you know, I can, you should buy my pizza tonight. <laughs> Best idea you've had all night, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, with me. And uh, I, well, would... I, I... <laughs> <laughs> one for the road. I would love to have yeah. you back again. Um, and uh, anytime, brother. Anytime. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Enjoy your pizza. That's the man room. We're out of here. For fuck's sake, thanks for listening. <laughs> Transmission. Transmission. <laughs>